So if you have any questions specific to this, uh, you are encouraged to ask your question now. Thank you. Yes. So just so I can, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the, what's ethical and what's unethical and when to intervene? Because I understand that we wouldn't want to ask parents to not spend time reading to their children. Uh, right? Like if that's too much to ask them to do that. Not good. But isn't, isn't it... Uh, um, it would really be a good policy to incentivize parents to don't read to their children, to read to their children. And in this way, we would be like trying to reduce a gap, right, between two groups of families uh, in something that's very intimate, uh, but maybe not unfair. So it's, it's more of a philosophical question. Right, yeah, I, I, think, I think this has been a very difficult uh, issue for public policy makers because where does the state begin and where do parents uh, you know, become responsible, right? Um, and I think the upshot of Adam uh, Swift's point is that, well, the state should not you know, intrude into the very private you know, domain of what defines them, right? Therefore, uh, you know, if there are really parents who are conscious and who are dedicated and devoted in terms of doing these little things, including when opening the door, actually talking to the child. And if any inequality emerges because of uh, such parenting uh, behavior, that should be tolerated and we should not be coaching parents. Well, but I understand what you mean that that's good, it shouldn't be punished, yeah. because it's good that parents do that. But because we know it's good, and we know it's good for kids, and as a state we care about the education of kids, all kids. Uh, wouldn't we want to say to the parents who don't do it, oh, maybe you should do it. Like, it's good for the kids. Maybe they don't know it's good for the kids. And we can incentivize them to act differently. And I'm not sure if it's true that something that doesn't uh, eat the state at all, because at the end, it affects results. Well, yes, I mean, that's exactly where you're going into the discussion of instrumental value of parents versus uh, philosophers who are kind of interested in the intrinsic value of a family and respecting that without any return. Right? If we care about a loving mother, we, you know, we would love to uh, have a father who would really be better than stories regardless of whether this will make me become an Einstein. Right? So, but I think you are making a very good point because when we look into the ECD literature, there's already a lot of intervention doing exactly that. Early, early childhood and Chico's presentation today was quite striking that before children would go to school, in the very first four months, we can clearly see cognitive gap emerging by parental education background. And a lot of those educated parents were actually responsible, engaged, and very intimate parents. There is this very fascinating uh, book written in the 1990s about a four million words gap that well, children raised in working parents were growing up listening to fewer words versus children from professional white collar families uh, being exposed to higher word count and that was quite creating this early learning advantage. So of course, you know, that creates very big dilemma for the state and many would take your position. I'm just presenting this uh, com 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 competing philosophical uh, uh, viewpoint um, you know, which is out there, and of course it has created an ethical dilemma, right? Because as a state, we want to equalize our children. I think their response would be that, yes, we want a very uh, good education system where regardless of children's background, there should be corrective measure, but we should not really get into the private space of family. So you can have a lot of those remedial policies at school for everyone regardless of their background. Correct. They are correlated. So, 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 so they are correlated. But this is, I think, a point that Chico also mentioned that this decomposition exercise. They are descriptive in nature, not causal. Um, and uh, so, I think the going forward, 
the idea would be to revisit them with better data and establish whether the pattern is uh, something we see in different contexts and in different studies. But of course, there is some correlation, but the correlation is nowhere close to perfect, or, or we don't have high coordinated problem in that sense. I mean, it is great, but, but, but as you say, can you can see how we can be able to separate the quality of the interaction? I mean, the, the quality of, of, of interaction depends on the list of, 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 so, of the location of the pattern of the model. So the, the, the intimate interaction that, that we're talking about is, is embedded in the, in the stock of, of assets and, and the location of the so, so, so it's very interesting to say, okay, that, 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 that is metrical and, 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 and that is antithetical and because we cannot separate that in my, in my perspective. Right, okay, so in, in our model, we have separate control for parental uh, background, including educational background. Right? So in, uh, in Chico's presentation today, he only focused on educational background. So we are saying that, well, we acknowledge that, it's there. And we consider that as not acceptable source of inequality. But when we have a measure which is independent of that, correlated, but it is there in the data, and if we let the data speak, does the data find a stronger correlation with measures which are in addition to parental background, but proxying for intimate familial interaction? And the answer is yes. So if your concern is true, that is highly correlated, then these additional measure of intimate familial background wouldn't have much predictive power. So that is all, all I can add, but you know, it's a fair point. Um, that, you know, that is there in the data, that correlation is there, but what we find is that the measure of intimate familial interaction prompts the contribution of parental education. Uh, so I have two questions. One is that how do you measure the parental efforts exactly that the intimate family uh, efforts that you're saying? And the second is that, is it possible that uh, the different, uh, let's say there are siblings, and like for the different kids, the parents' effort could be different based on, let's say, gender? Right, thank you. I rushed too fast. Uh, so we have uh, several measures of parental effort. One is time spent by mother, aiding the child for education matters at home during school closure, in minutes, the same by father, and then time spent by mother, on childcare. So this is independent of educational activities. So these are three uh, measures. They are, again, in time inputs. And uh, we even collected independent measure of this from the student, asking, how much does your mother spend time on you, while also asking mother? So we can even check for measurement errors and all that. So that's where it goes. But of course, you know, we could also collect more data on bedtime stories and then you know other type of, type of activities like conversation uh, over a meal and all that. Uh, but we you know if we go by the evidence, adding those perhaps would just increase our predictive uh, power. Yeah. And because siblings is oh so siblings that's a good point. Now, now uh, Bangladesh has kind of reached the replacement level stage now so that for uh, most families, in one uh, schooling age group, typically there is one child. So it means our average family has two children. And uh, so ours is focused on primary and secondary school children. Uh, so there are siblings, but very in small cases, siblings are on the same education level. So therefore, you know, they're not really competing in the same category, but it's a fair point that something we can do. Any other question? Uh, um, so, what would you say are the policy implications of the uh, But I think that I contribute with the literature, like with the more I don't know broad uh, aspect, like showing that there is imp it's important to be exposed to like diversity, not only uh, from rich and poor students, but also like sex diversity leads to more progressive like gender views like in general. I mean, I, mean, I, just, I, I, I think the paper is pretty good and the results are very, very good. But I think that the paper is pretty good and the results are very, very good. I'm just wondering if, because we find the results are very strong, even like the level 
less time uh, dedicated to vascular and gender, okay? I mean, it does that the question should be trying to change the gender composition of the platforms. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have here like single sex schools, so to check like the, if, if sex schools are even worse than like mixed sex schools. So I, I, I cannot like uh, make that policy implication like straightforward, but I think that, yeah, it's like an implicit message that it's important to be exposed to a more diverse environment, uh, more in general. Okay, so, sorry, yes. yes uh, my question has to do precisely with the uh, type of novel narrative effects. Uh, in particular, I was wondering if you have any idea of the support of the independent variable. I think that maybe if the independent variable is somehow bounded, the effect that we are finding uh, is only representative for the bound of the support. Something like, for instance, if the female composition of the classroom goes up to 75% or something like that, and then you get a positive effect, but if the female composition goes over 75%, then you get no effect. And or something of the other kind. So I was wondering if you have anything about that. I was checking if I had a figure here like to, to check of the of the um, support of the variable. So I don't have single sex schools nor like but I have a wide like uh, support for the share of female peers in, in the classroom. It's not concentrated on from 40 to 60, uh, but I have like a wide range of, of percentage of female peers. Uh, and as I said, like further research on this will be to analyze non-linearities and check whether the changes are, exp the defects are explained from students moving from, I don't know, 45 percentage of female peers to 55 or concentrated like moving from the 20 to the 80 uh, percentile of uh, female peers in the classroom. But I, unfortunately, I don't have the figure here, but we can talk about that later. Okay, so as a chair, I'll exercise my monopoly power and ask you the last question. Um, so I'm just reflecting on your result, and um, it seemed that uh, what you claim as uh, the peer effect could be simply reflecting the fact that typically, when school authorities uh, reassign students, uh, they would sort students based on disciplinary behavior. And literature shows that boys are more disruptive than girls. So it could essentially be that, well, larger female shares means that you have more well-behaved students uh, in the classroom. And I don't know in your context whether you have got a smaller class sizes for disruptive students. There, by default, the female share would be low. There is actually a nice paper in QJ on this. That, uh, so and if that happens, then your results could be simply reflecting the fact that what you claim as female share, not a female share, is actually exposure to less disruptive students. Yeah. Less, that's a good point. Unfortunately, I don't have in the data like um, disruptive behavior like reported uh, in the data. But as I said, uh, the procedure of assignment uh, of the students uh, into classes is made up by the head of the, the, of the school. And it seeks to preserve some homogeneity in a broad set of characteristics. So like behavior is one of those. If they have like previous information of uh, misbehavior of all the students, they are going to arrange classes uh, to preserve like homogeneity on group composition within the same school because the head of the school have that information uh, but then um, I, I checked that uh, following like two different approaches to check if the of the actual like sex composition uh, follows a good as, as and as good as random distribution and I found like supportive evidence showing that in fact the the assignment of the students to classes is as good as random so, so the reason why I raise is because in your actual sample there is a voice deficit you have more girls and boys. And yeah, on average. On average. Yeah. And, and, and so, because in many other countries, there's missing boys phenomena. So they're less interested in education. And whether when you have that in the population, uh, how would you in, in interpret your result, given that, well, disruptive behavior or lack of discipline motivation is actually making boys participate in education less, so that you have more girls in general. Yeah, but in that case, I included um, the previous repetition variable individually and also like a peer, um, the share of uh, peers with the, uh, 
previous grade repetition as control variables. So to like, like kind of control for ability or misbehavior, I have that variable and I included that at individual level and also at perfect level. So I, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's like a proxy of uh, ability and misbehavior. Thank you so much, Martina. No, it's a very nice presentation. I think it's on. Okay. We're running a little bit behind the schedule still. You know, I hope you can stay back for five more minutes and uh, share your constructive comments, suggestions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no. So that is not possible that we can link the student with the, the teachers. I mean, that would be really nice because then we can check the identity of the of both the teachers and the student, but that's not possible. Yeah. Quick question. So I understand that the village dominance that's given based on historical development, but there is nothing that stops a marginalized family from moving away across location. The migration story. Mm -hmm. So have you looked into the pattern? That, yeah. You know, duration of settlement in a village, uh, because going by your logic, uh, the equilibrium outcome is for every scheduled cost we actually move into villages where they would have more people similar in terms of sociality. Yes. So what is the pattern of migration? Uh, you know, is there a higher rate of count migration among scheduled caste compared to non scheduled caste? Okay, so I think one thing that that we have in our uh, this thing is that more than ninety five, so around ninety four or ninety five percent of the population has been staying in their village of residence for fifty years of more. So this kind of signals that there is a low I cast wise. Yeah. So this is something that yeah we can do. Yeah. Yeah, that we haven't checked. And the second point is that your main punchline is the teacher effect. And I understand that well if the teacher is more like me, uh, I'm benefiting, but then you know, within Indian context that well if you think of teacher mobility, mm -hmm. uh, teachers, high quality teachers would like to go to a village dominated by the student class. Right, so therefore there is negative sorting based on teacher quality while there is positive sorting based on social identity that I get. So this is where I think uh, his question is very important that well, you know, if you would do maybe use another data set to kind of match the teacher's identity and then have some measure of quality yeah. to kind of check which is meaning this uh, mm -hmm. battle of two horses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. Yeah, this is what we tried to, we even wanted to try, but this data does not allow us. But I think, yeah, we can look for some alternative data set where we can match this, the the identity and Where's even the, the location. Yeah, yeah, is that's okay. Thank you. We've got one last question. So we know that in India, the north south divide, that in southern part of India, your social identity becomes weaker. Mm -hmm. because the region there is less social discrimination versus northern part of India. Yes. So if you were to slice your results, do you see this being stable or does it flip? Okay, no, so we, this is something that we haven't done. So Sophia, but I think, yeah, this is something that we can look for the heterogeneity across uh, the north and south. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so again, thank you so much. I know I'm holding back. Again, thank you for.